So it's truly a pleasure to be here. Um, I remember when I started, I was much younger. Time evolves, and lots of people get older. Some of us are even maybe elderly, but there's one person like uh, Jean and Dr. Klein and Dr. Reiser who keep getting younger. That's very kind. Okay, so let me start by talking about uh, the complication of acute AMI. There are uh, really four types, or three types, hemodynamic disturbances, uh, of which there are four types, LV failure, with or without RV failure, RV failure predominantly, cardiogenic shock, and mechanical complications. I will be spending most of the time on mechanical complications because really these are, although the most infrequent, these are the most dreadful. So they have the higher mortality and morbidity. Uh, I may not, be have, may not have the time to touch on arrhythmia complications, but it's all in your slides, and I hope to be able to touch on some of the pericardial complications, which now are extremely infrequent. So let me start by uh, telling you that there are three types of major mechanical complications uh, complicating the acute MI, and here we're predominantly talking about a ST elevation myocardial infarction. There's LV free wall rupture, uh, VSD or interventricular septal rupture, and development of mitral regurg. And the mainstay treatment for these are, is surgical repair plus or uh, minus surgical uh, revascularization uh, when needed. So, um, the, uh, uh, the occurrence uh, or, or the incidence of these mechanical complications are extremely rare or very infrequent. They are less than 1%. So in the relatively contemporary, or maybe now it's a decade old actually, Apex AMI st uh, study from 2004 to 2006, the mechanical complications incidence was less than 1%. It was 0.91%. And uh, uh, if you do not have a mechanical complication, complicated acute MI, your survival is 96% plus at 90 days. However, if you have any of the three complications, your survival will go down to an average of 60, 70%. Highest mortality at 90 days is for free wall, is for acute MR actually 73%, then for free wall rupture, then for uh, VSD. So very infrequent, but uh, high uh, mortality and morbidity. Let's start with the LV free wall rupture. The risk factors for this is no prior engine or MI, big, uh, MI, with usually transmural, full thickness MI, and pharmaceutical therapy in the old days accelerate the occurrence and the time of onset of uh, LV free wall rupture. But with the primary PCI, you've got reduced incidence, and other risk factors include, include anterior location, age, and uh, uh, female sex. Now, uh, the timing usually 50% occur within the first five days and nearly almost of them occur within the first two weeks. And the timing is re really bimodal. So you have an early phase within less than 72 hours, and then the rest occur late, more than four days, but really less than two weeks. And it commonly affects the anterior and the lateral walls of the LV, usually near the junction of the infected and normal myocardium. So the clinical uh, presentation is threefold, could be sudden cardiac death, hemopericardium leading to temporad and death, and very infrequently, you have incomplete rupture with uh, uh, indolent course. And uh, the uh, diagnostic modality of choice is by echocardiogram. Um, and if you diagnose hemopericardium, uh, you want to do what you call controlled pericardiocentesis, whereby you do pericardiocentesis to uh, maintain some arterial blood pressure, but not to exsanguinate the patient. So it's, uh, you do frequent taps or frequent uh, withdrawal of blood, and then you go for immediate surgery. And of course, in the interim, you do hemodynamic stabilization before going to surgery. Now, VSD uh, is the second mechanical complication. Its incidence is half that of free wall rupture, but it has really, at least in the apex AMI, doubled the uh, mortality. And it has the same timing uh, uh, with bimodal uh, uh, timing uh, uh, occurring either at uh, early on or uh, after three to five days, uh, but certainly before two weeks. The risk factors are very similar, uh, but uh, it usually affects a uh, patient with MI affecting a single uh, large uh, coronary artery, especially a wrap around LED. So an LED that reaches the apex and, round and wraps to the mid inferior wall, and at that time you have an apical uh, uh, VSD uh, uh, complicating uh, a large transmural wrap around LED. Um, and uh, it can occur equally in the anterior and non-anterior MI, uh, 
Uh, if it's happening with anterior MI, it usually affects the apex. If it's happening in the, with the inferior MI, it's usually uh, at the base of the inferior wall, and usually it develops at the margin of the necrotic and non-necrotic myocardium. And the clinical manifestations are usually hypotension, by ventricular failure, predominantly right-sided, and you hear often a loud, harsh, holosystolic murmur with a palpable thrill, RV lift, and a very hyperdynamic uh, precordium. If you do a right heart cast, you uh, usually see a giant V waves, and uh, uh, an echocardiogram is usually the mainstay uh, for diagnosis, and uh, you need to proceed with surgical repair. Now, in the past, surgical repair timing used to be controversial. In the old retrospective uh, data, if you waited a few weeks, you get uh, uh, the scar to heal and a better chance of survival when you repair VSD. However, these data are confounded by uh, selection bias patients who were able to wait for six weeks or more uh, self-selected themselves to be survivors. Uh, so now, uh, there is especially, uh, I mean, if you have cardiac shock, you need to proceed immediately. But nowadays, with uh, PVAD, uh, percutaneous ventricular assist devices, whether it's tandem heart or impellas, you could stabilize some uh, of these patients, allow a few days for them to heal, and then proceed with surgical repair, uh, hopefully with concomitant cabbage, because that increases uh, the survival. Uh, so this is uh, now, when was it, uh, almost eight years ago, uh, I was in Boston. Uh, that was my very first case of VSD closure, uh, uh, doing it with my uh, mentor. And at that time, I remember we closed, this is published in European Heart Journal. Uh, it's a, a mid-LED uh, acute AMI with an apical uh, VSD. We closed it with an interaortic balloon pump, uh, going actually from the right-sided approach uh, uh, and at that time, I still remember the patient blood pressure was nearly 40, 50 all throughout the procedure. Although the procedure was successful, the patient ended up dying, really, uh, uh, because uh, of multi-organ failure. Nowadays, we have real support devices, the percutaneous ventricular assist devices, whether it's impella, uh, uh, CP, or uh, tandem hearts. And this is a case we've done three, three years now of an apical VSD supported with a tandem heart. You could see over here that the tandem heart cannula is across the interventricular septum, um, unloading the heart, unloading the heart uh, really approximately or upstream from the left atrium. And then retrogradely we have uh, the, uh, I believe that's a Jatkins right, uh, uh, five French or so, uh, crossing from the left to the right. Uh, you could cross also with a uh, 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 balloon flotation uh, catheter with a wire. And then once you cross from the left side uh, to the right side, uh, best to position your wire into the pomoria artery because it's easier to snare the wire. And then we snared the wire from the pomoria artery. Uh, we use an extra stiff wire that we snared and externalized uh, in the, from the arterial to the venous side. So we have now a very good rail to rail our device uh, over. And you could see over here from the venous side, antigradely, we uh, came up uh, with the uh, uh, delivery sheet across the apical VSD. Uh, you always want to protect your wire, um, your stiff wire, uh, with a catheter so that you don't cut the aortic valve or any of the cardiac structures. And you're, we're delivering here the left disc of the Amplatzer VSD device, and then the right disc, and the patient did extremely well. So nowadays, the paradigm is really to passivate this patient with percutaneous ventricular assist device, let the scar heal, at which time you could close better. But if they're really, really decompensated, then you can't do that. Uh, you, you need to be going as early as you can. Acute matter regurgitation is the third complication of acute MI, and moderate to severe MI can occur with uh, up to uh, two to three percent of all acute MIs, but in shock patients, it's up to 40 percent. And of course, the cause of matter regurgitation could be threefold ischemic popular muscle displacement, popular muscle rupture, or LV dilatation from uh, severe uh, uh, LV dysfunction. Uh, you hear a uh, holosystolic murmur, but in 50% of the time, if you have equalization of the LV uh, and uh, left atrium, uh, you can hear a very soft murmur or no murmur. So don't, the absence of murmur that should not fool you that this is not an acute mitral rigors complicated an acute MI. And uh, the papillary muscle rupture may be partial, and uh, it usually affects the posterior medial papillary muscle because of its single blood supply as opposed to the... Um, 
uh, anterolateral papillary muscle. And the clinical manifestation is very similar to the VSD, acute hypotension, pulmonary edema, hyperactive precordium, with a holosystolic murmur, but in 50% of the time, it's not very loud. It could be very soft or absent, and giant V waves. And remember, giant V waves are really not pathognomonic, non neither sensitive nor specific. They could happen with VSD, with severe heart failure, and they really depend on the left atrial compliance. Uh, diagnosis is usually uh, clinical, of course, with an echocardiogram, and oftentimes, not oftentimes, but in maybe 30, 40% of the time, you may need an, a transesophageal echocardiogram to visualize the prolapsing uh, papillary muscle into the left atrium. Remember, the left atrium is the most posterior uh, structure of the heart, and the TE could visualize it very well. Treatment, again, after stabilization uh, and aggressive afterload reduction, uh, emergent surgical intervention is the treatment of choice uh, in these patients with concomitant cabbage if needed. So uh, I ended the mechanical complications. Again, you're going to see very, very few of these, but you need to know how to diagnose them because they're very deadly when they occur. Now, I have the time only to go over LV failure and possibly cardiogenic shock, and the rest is going to be in your slides. Uh, whenever you have a heart failure or ventricular uh, LV failure complicating MI, you've got usually systolic and diastolic dysfunction. And with systolic dysfunction, you have low cardiac output. With diastolic dysfunction, you get pulmonary venous congestion and pulmonary edema. And uh, please remember the treatment of choice is not anotropic and vasopressors. If you could unload the heart with vasodilators and after load reduction, that's the way to go, uh, especially to minimize increase in myocardial oxygen demands and to avoid arrhythmias. So besides uh, oxygenation and whether endotracheal intubation or mechanical ventilation, after that you need to unload the heart with diuretics, but avoid excessive diuresis. You'd want to maintain LVDP at least above 18. Remember, these patients have a shifted Frank Sterling curve and they need a good uh, 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 LVDP for their performance. Uh, and then you need to afterload and preload reduce these agents. And the best is really a combination of nitroprusside and nitroglycerin, if possible. Uh, uh, remember, nitroprusside can exacerbate ischemia, and remember, it's contraindicated with severe renal insufficiency. But if you could maintain a systolic blood pressure above 90 and a wedge uh, in the 18 to 20 range, that would be your goal. And vasodilators are really recommended whenever you have a room in your blood pressure uh, in these patients uh, uh, with heart failure complicating MI. Now, if you don't have if the patient is hypotensive and you're unable to use vasodilators to unload the hearts, then this is when you use your beta agonist, uh, dobutamine uh, uh, to increase your anthropic uh, function, uh, dopamine at a very low dose if needed to uh, complement dopamine, uh, no more than five microgram or so, uh, to achieve natriuretic effects, some uh, vasodilatory uh, effect on the splanking circulation, but no more than that. Remember, in 2010, there was a major shock paper examining actually norepinephrine versus dopamine, and the subset of patients with cardiogenic shock dopamine really had a signal of improve, increased harm because of its tachyarrhythmia and decreased myocardial oxygen demand. So nowadays, in addition to dobutamine, I try to use norepinephrine or levofed. And if need be, you could use milrinone. Uh, 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 also has tachyarrhythmia effects, but it's an excellent pulmonary hypertension vasodilator. Um, I'm going to end by telling you cardiogenic shock is the other major hemodynamic complication. Uh, it complicates six to seven, six to eight percent, around seven percent of all MIs. The one thing you need to remember that it doesn't only happen with acute ST elevation MI, it also happens with up to two, three percent of non ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And uh, uh, very important to realize uh, that it's uh, uh, part of its uh, classic uh, paradigm is not only diastolic and systolic myocardial dysfunction, but also in systemic inflammatory uh, syndrome and release of nitric oxide. And that's why at the very end stages, instead of having high SVR, you may have uh, extreme visualization and really low SVR. And the shock trial now is historic. It's more than uh, 15 years old. Old, very small study that showed mortality benefits in its secondary endpoint at six uh, months with survival benefits from revascularization. This is something we take now for granted, but that was studied in 1999 from, by an, an NHLBI uh, grant uh, showing that compared to medical therapy, revascularization, of which one third, by the way, was surgical at that time, uh, improved survival. And the benefits of revascularization 
uh, at any time you need to proceed with revascularization with cardiac shock is evident in every subgroup. Now, early on in the elderly, there was an issue of a signal of harm. We no longer believe this. We know, and we've done one of the systematic review actually with one of the Baylor cardiology followers showing really at every age group in appropriately selected patients, you get a survival benefit from revascularizing the patient irrespective of age. And um, um, beware of iatrogenic shock induced by IV beta blocker. IV beta blocker is no longer a cardiac performance measure. Uh, it was taken out from the 06 performance measure in the aftermath of the COMET trial, which showed an increased signal of cardiac shock that really counterbalanced the beneficial effect of IV beta blocker on reducing MI as sudden cardiac death. So the shock signal was really major, up to 5%, and we no longer use it in acute MI. We are currently revising the performance measures, and I think we should come up with a statement uh, in 2016. Uh, balloon pump works very rarely, or very weakly, uh, in cardiogenic shock. We have the SHOCK2 trial published maybe a year ago now or more. Uh, maybe lower risk shock, but at least at 30 day in a 600 patient plus showing no benefits. Uh, over uh, 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 just primary PCI in ST elevation MI. So it wouldn't be my first choice to use it. I would use other precursor ventricular assist devices, whether it's the impellas or the tandem hearts, mostly the impella because of its ease of use. Saying that in high risk PCI and in patients with refractory ischemia, balloon pump is still very beneficial. It can increase your cardiac output anywhere between 0.5 to 0.9 liter per minute, can increase your coronary perfusion. It's a seven and a half to eight French, easy to use, and so forth. Again, the SHOCK2 trial uh, recently released showed no benefit of balloon pump in shock patients uh, uh, caused by acute MI. Now, when I talk about shock now, I've been talking about MI, acute MI uh, related shock, but remember 20% of cardiogenic shock is uh, cause uh, is related to, not predominantly to acute myocardial infarction, is related to other etiologies. Uh, could be mechanical complication of acute MI, but also could be uh, venous thromboembolism, uh, cardiac tamponade, and so forth. Uh, uh, just to close, uh, impellas at tandem heart, we have now the uh, stronger impella, the impella cardiac power that achieves 3.5 liter per minute or more. And uh, this really, I, in, I believe will uh, take over from the tandem heart uh, uh, that uh, uh, achieves up to five liter uh, or plus uh, uh, per minute. And usually we used to think that tandem heart really is the ultimate. It can close the aortic valve and take over completely uh, the mechanics of the heart. But with a cardiac power impella, I think you could do a very high risk PCI and maintain cardiogenic shock patients uh, very, very well. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, stop here because of the sake of time. Thank you for allowing me a few extra minutes. It's a pleasure to be here. And you have the slides in your, uh, uh, in your uh, curriculum. Thank you for your time.